Eva Kaur is a Holocaust survivor, forgiveness advocate, and public speaker. Powered by a never give up attitude, Eva has emerged from a trauma-filled childhood as a brilliant example of the human spirit's power to overcome. Even at the age of 80, she continues to be a community leader, champion of human rights, and a tireless educator. Eva founded CANDLES, which stands for Children of Auschwitz Nazi Deadly Lab Experiments Survivors, and opened the CANDLES Holocaust Museum and Education Center in Terre Haute, Indiana, with an ever-broadening vision of teaching visitors the importance of forgiveness, respect, equality, and peace. It is my privilege to introduce Eva Kaur. Thank you, now it's on. Can you all hear me? Good afternoon. I'm very, very pleased to be here. I don't exactly understand why I was asked to speak at a conference on aging. <laughs> I'm still very young. My name is Eva Kaur. I am a survivor of Auschwitz, a survivor of medical experiments conducted by Dr. Mengele. And now that I am 81 years old, I am trying to survive old age. And if I figure, <laughs> and if I figure that one out, I will share it with you. <laughs> My lecture is divided in three parts. Part one, how I survived Auschwitz. Part two, even more important, the lessons that I have learned from my tragic life. And part three, we are going to open it for questions and answers. It was the dawn of an early spring day in 1944. Our cattle car train came to a sudden stop. I could hear a lot of Germans yelling orders outside. We have been traveling for four days, cooped in a cattle car, about 100 people. Among the 100 people was my father, Alexander Moses, age 44, my mother, Jaffa Moses, age 38, my oldest sister, Edith Moses, age 14, my middle sister, Alice, 12, and Miriam and I, who were twins, we were 10 years old. I couldn't see anything in the crowded cattle car, except there was a patch of gray sky that I could see through the barbed wires in the window. As soon as we stepped down from the cattle car onto a cement platform called the selection platform, and I, can, I have to talk about the selection platform a little. In my opinion, there is no other strip of land like that, measuring 85 feet long by 35 feet wide, that has witnessed so many millions of people being ripped apart from their family forever. As we stepped down, my mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand. We were her youngest children, and she hoped that as long as she could hold on to us, that somehow she could protect us. Everything was moving very fast. There was a lot of yelling, crying, pushing. And I was curious, at age 10, I looked around, trying to figure out what on earth is this place. Then I realized that my father and two older sisters disappeared in the crowd. Never ever did I see them again. As we were holding on to mother, a Nazi was running and yelling in German, twins, twins. We did not volunteer any information because we had no idea what worked in this place. He noticed us because Miriam and I were always dressed alike and we always looked alike. 
He demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother didn't know what to say. She asked, is that good? And the Nazi nodded, yes. And my mother said, yes. At that moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother in one direction. We were pulled in the opposite direction. We were crying. She was crying. All I really remember is seeing my mother's arm stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never even got to say goodbye to her. But I didn't really understand that this would be the last time that we would see her. And all that took 30 minutes from the time we stepped down from the cattle car, Miriam and I no longer had a family, we were all alone, and we had no idea what would happen to us. We became part of a little group of children, girls. There were 13 sets of little twin girls between the ages of 2 and 16. I am sure that on that long selection platform, there were little sets of boy twins, age 2 to 16, and also older, because that is the way we were kept in our barrack, according to age and sex. So in our group, there were 13 sets of little girls, and one mother somehow was permitted to stay with us, with her twin, seven-year-old twin daughters. Her name was Mrs. Changery. I knew her because she was my mother's friend. Our group was led to a huge building, a processing center. Our clothes were taken away. And we sat naked for most of the day without really knowing what would happen to us. At times, I closed my eyes, hoping that when I opened them, the nightmare would disappear. But the nightmare did not disappear. It was late in the afternoon when our processing began. We were given short haircuts. The mother's head was shaved. Our dresses were returned with a huge oil-painted red cross on the back, which I found out years later because, of course, we were part of experiments. The mother was given striped prison uniform, then they lined us up for registration and tattooing. When my turn came, I decided to give them as much trouble as a 10-year-old could. Four people restrained me, two Nazis and two women prisoners, while they heated a needle attached to a handle, and they heated the needle over the flame of a lamp. When the needle got hot, they dipped it into ink, and then they burned into my left arm, dot by dot, the capital letter A, dash 7063. Miriam became capital A-7064. Auschwitz was the only Nazi camp that tattooed its inmates. My husband is a survivor of four years in Buchenwald. He does not have a tattoo. Once we were processed, we were marched out of the building. But I want to tell you about the tattoo, that when I compared notes with Miriam in 1985, I asked her, do you remember Miriam when the tattoo was happening? She said, yes. And she said to me that I created a general confusion in addition to carrying on as four Nazis, two Nazis and two women prisoners were trying to pin me on, the, on a bench, that I beat the Nazi that was holding my arm. Now, I am sure that I was capable of doing it, but I was raised to be a nice girl. <laughs> and as we know, nice girls and nice boys don't bite. So I must have blocked it out of my mind. 
Once we were processed, we were marched throughout the camp and we arrived at a wooden modular horse barn. Crude and filthy. I have never seen anything filthier in my life. The barrack is divided in two. In the middle, there is a brick bench. On each side of the brick bench, there is a walkway, and then the three-story high bunk beds. Miriam and I were given a bunk bed on the bottom. It was covered with a thin straw mattress and a filthy blanket. Well, we have not been able to even stretch out in four days in the cattle car. So we thought maybe we could stretch out and sleep a little. In my opinion, human beings cannot function after such a traumatic day because I kept tossing and turning and I couldn't sleep. And as I was tossing and turning, I noticed something big and dark moving by the base of that brick bench and I began counting. These were the biggest mice I have ever seen. When I got to five, I jumped up screaming, mice, mice. A girl from the top bunk that said, silly kid, these are not mice. They are rats. You better get used to them because they are everywhere. So now we couldn't even try to go back to sleep. We went to the latrine. And as I entered the place, there on the filthy latrine floor, were the scattered corpses of three children. I have never, ever seen anybody dead. But it was clear to me that in this place, children were dying. So right then and there, I made a silent pledge that I will do anything and everything within my power to make sure that Miriam and I shall not end up on that filthy latrine floor. From the moment we left the latrine, I did everything instinctively, and I did everything instinctively right. I never let any doubt or fear enter in my mind. In my mind, I had an image of how Miriam and I might look the day we walked out of this camp alive. And I never let go of that image until the day we were liberated. Our daily routine, we would be awakened every morning at 5 a.m. We helped the younger children, because in the barrack were children from age 2 to 16. So the 2, the 3, the 4, the 5, and the 6, even the 7-year-old, we helped them put on their shoes and lace them up. We never had to help anybody dress up because we never took our clothes off. All we really had in our life were our clothes, our lives and our clothes on our back. Then by 6 a.m. we would go outside for roll call, summer, winter, rain or shine. And I can tell you that by the time the winter of 1944-45 rolled around, my dress was filled with holes, and so were my shoes. No, we did not get any winter clothes. I have no idea how we survived, because I was just in Auschwitz in January this year to observe the 70th anniversary to the liberation. I had my Ugg boots, and I had two layers of clothing, plus my wool coat, and I was freezing to death. So how did we survive 70 years ago? I don't know. After roll call, we would go back to the barrack for Dr. Joseph Mengele's daily inspection. He would come in every day except on Sunday. And that is the way we knew it was Sunday. After that, Mengele would leave and we would get breakfast, which was nothing more but a brownish, bitter, lukewarm liquid called coffee zero calories. At noon, if we were in the barrack, we would get something that looked like cream of wheat, but it was impossible to swallow. So I am sure it was not cream of wheat. 
And at night, we would get a very dark piece of bread, about two inches, but it tasted pretty good, and that filled my empty stomach. After a few days in Auschwitz, I realized what the routine was, and I realized that at night, I could sleep, even though I was very hungry. But the long days without any food in my stomach was agonizing. So it made sense for me to save my bread for next morning. Next morning, I woke up, my bread was gone, stolen by those huge rats. So I had a very difficult decision to make every night. Should I eat my bread tonight and have something to eat? Or should I gamble and maybe have something tomorrow morning? The Nazis could have given us the bread in the morning, as they did with the inmates who were going to work. But we were not even given that much help. So after our breakfast, we would be taken for experiment. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we would be taken to a huge room, about 50 sets of twins. Our clothes were removed, and we sat naked, sat or stood alternately, naked for up to eight hours a day. They would measure just about every part of my body. They could spend three to four hours on one earlobe. It had to be measured to the most minute detail, or four hours on a hand or arm. Then comparing it to my twin sister and comparing it to charts. These experiments were not dangerous, but how would any of you cope if you had to stand or sit naked for eight hours in order to live one more day? The only way that I could cope with it is by blocking it out of my mind. On alternate days, on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we would be taken to another lab that I call the blood lab. There, they would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. The content of those injections, we didn't know then, nor do I know today. The rumor in the camp was that they were germs, diseases, and drugs. And that probably is a pretty good assumption. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever effect. I desperately tried to hide because we knew that anybody taken to the hospital never came back. And what would happen in the barrack? One twin would disappear, and a few weeks later, the other twin would disappear. And the rumor was that they both died or were killed. So I wanted to prevent the fact from being taken to the hospital. The next visit to the blood lab, they didn't tie my arms for blood taking and injections. Instead of that, they measured my fever, and I knew I was in trouble. I had a very high fever. I remember trembling even as the August sun was burning my skin. My legs and arms were swollen and very painful, and I had huge red spots throughout my body. So after they measured my fever, I was taken to the hospital, which was an other barrack. But this barrack was filled with people who looked more dead than alive. Next morning, Dr. Mengele came in with four other doctors. He never, ever examined me. All he did, he looked at my fever chart, and then he declared, laughing sarcastically, he said, too bad, she's so young. She has only two weeks to learn. I knew he was right, but I refused to die. So I made a second silent pledge 
that I will prove Dr. Mengele wrong, I will survive and be reunited with my twin sister, Miriam. For the following two weeks, all I really remember, I have only one clear memory, crawling on the barrack floor because I no longer could walk. And I was crawling to reach a faucet with water at the other end of the barrack because this barrack was not even allocated water. People were brought there to die. And as I was crawling, I would fade in and out of consciousness. And even in a semi-conscious state of mind, I kept telling myself, I must survive, I must survive. After two weeks, my fever broke, and I immediately felt a lot stronger. It took me another three weeks before my fever chart showed the normal, and I was released and reunited with the other twin and Miriam. But the happiness of our reunion was short-lived. Miriam looked very sick. She looked just like the living dead I left in the barracks. And I couldn't understand. If she was sick, why wasn't she taken to the hospital? Because they usually didn't keep sick twins in the barrack. And I asked her, what happened to you? What have they done to you? She said, I cannot talk about it. I will not talk about it. And Miriam and I never talked about Auschwitz until 1985. The word Auschwitz never came up in our conversation. In 1985, I asked her, I said, Miriam, do you remember when I was taken to the hospital? She said, yes. I said, well, what happened to you while I was in the hospital? She said, for the first two weeks after you were taken away, I was kept in isolation with Nazi doctors studying me and waiting for something to happen. They did not tell me what they were waiting for. Therefore, I don't know if it happened or it didn't happen. But it was the same two weeks that Mengele said I would die. Would I have died? Miriam would have been rushed immediately to Mengele's lab, killed with an injection to the heart, and then Mengele would have done the comparative autopsies. My diseased organs compared to Miriam. I spoiled the experiment. I survived. And amazingly, neither one of us were harmed. I said to Miriam, what happened to you after the two weeks were up? She said, I was taken back to the labs, injected with many, many injections that made me feel very sick. After the war, Miriam was always weaker, and sicker than I was. She got married in 1958, expected her first baby in 1960, and she developed severe kidney infections that did not respond to any antibiotic. Second pregnancy in 1963, the infection got worse. And this time the Israeli doctors studied Miriam and they found out that Miriam's kidneys never grew larger than the size of a 10-year-old child. Whatever she was injected with stunted the growth of her kidneys. I begged Miriam, don't have any more children. Every pregnancy is a life crisis. You have two children, that's pretty good. But Miriam didn't listen to me. She had a third child. Actually, it was about 10 years later, but it was after a war when many of the Israeli mothers wanted to replace somehow those who were lost on the battlefield, and she wanted to do her share. Well, after the baby was born, her kidneys started to deteriorate, and there was nothing that the doctors could do. And by 1987, her kidneys failed, at which time she had to go on dialysis. She didn't want to live on dialysis. She was a registered nurse. 
and she put her name on a list for transplant. Well, 1987 was a very difficult year for me. My son was diagnosed with advanced stage four testicular cancer, but I told her that as soon as my son was out of any danger, that after I underwent study to see if the doctors would permit me to donate one of my kidneys, that I would donate one of my kidneys, which is what happened. And it happened on November 16, 1987. We were a perfect match. The doctors were so excited. They said every blood vessel, every muscle, every organ is exactly in the same place. So we can unhook Eva's kidneys and hook it into Miriam. A year after the transplant, Miriam developed cancerous polyps in her bladder. At that hospital, they have been doing kidney transplants for 10 years. They had 2,000 survivors. All of them were given anti-rejection medication. None of them developed cancerous polyps. The doctors asked me if we could find our files. And I can tell you that I have tried everything within my power. We never found our files. We never found out what was injected into our body. Miriam's cancer metastasized everywhere. And she died June 6, 1993. I will take you back to the camp for some observations that I want to share with you. Children at age 10. Actually, children from age 6 to 13 function completely differently than teenagers and grown-ups. It takes a lot of energy for a child to function in the here and now. They cannot project backward, nor can they project forward. It takes all the energy a child has. So when I was in Auschwitz, I thought that the whole world was one big concentration camp. That everybody in the world lived like I lived, in miserable conditions, starving to death, without family or parents, guarded by the guards day and night. That is the way the world was. Until end of August of 1944, when suddenly an airplane appeared over the skies of Auschwitz. It was flying very low. I could see the American flag on one of the wings. And how on earth did I know how the American flag looked? I mean, the little primitive dinky village that I was born in in Transylvania had a hundred families. We had no running water, no electricity, and unpaved road. I knew when I lived there that there was a Romania because this is where I was born. I knew there was a Hungary because Hungary occupied the village in 1940. I knew there was a Germany because we had a big battery operated radio and Hitler would always yell in the radio that he would kill all the Jews. And we had an end in Cleveland, Ohio who would send us letters, and the stamp on the envelope looked like a flag. Well, I saw that flag on the one of the wings of that airplane. That gave me hope that somebody was trying to free us. And hope in Auschwitz was in very short supply. The air raids continued and increased. And by the end of November, it felt like a continuous battlefield. Almost, I, would, I can't even tell you for sure if there were four or five air raids a day, artillery. I could sense it in every ounce of my being that this cannot last much longer. All the experiments stopped, and we, the children, developed a little slogan among ourselves. Someday soon, we will be free and we will go home. 
But we had no idea how liberation would come. Nothing much happened on, from end of November until early January, when one day, about January 4 or 5, the Nazis ordered us to get out of the barrack because they are taking us deep into Germany to protect us from the fighting. Of course, it was continuous fighting. Well, in my childish mind, I did not like the Nazis when they were winning the war because they were mean to us. So I figured now that they are losing the war, they would be even meaner. And I didn't want to be near them. In addition to that, <coughs> I didn't want to go outside into that bitter cold with the skimpy clothing that we had. So we decided to stay in the barrack. Next morning, we woke up. We opened the barrack doors. We looked all around, and all the guard towers were empty. All the Nazis were gone. As I found out from the Auschwitz Museum, there were 150,000 inmates in Auschwitz II in Birkenau. Only 8,500 remained. The grown-ups cut the barbed wires so we could roam throughout the camp. Birkenau sits on 450 acres. It's a very, very large camp. We were roaming around to organize, and organize in camp language meant stealing from the Nazis, but please forgive me, I will always call it organizing. Uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I was lecturing at the museum to some fifth graders. And I asked them when I finished my lecture, so what did you learn? So one little cute boy said, next time I want to steal, I am going to call it organizing. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Only if you are in a situation like I was in Auschwitz, otherwise it's still stealing. So we have to make that clear. We needed to organize water, bread, and blankets. And one day I was in a kitchen, huge kitchen. It could feed 5,000 inmates. There were about 200 people with me, and we loaded up on as many loaves of bread as we could carry. Then we heard outside the sound of a car. No one had cars but the Nazis. So we went outside to investigate. There was an army vehicle like a jeep. Four Nazis jumped up, took out their machine guns, and they began spraying bullets indiscriminately. The last thing I remember, the barrel of the gun, about three feet from my head, and then I faded away. I woke up sometime later, and I have no idea how much later. I tried to feel my legs and my arms, and I could. I looked around. I was buried, surrounded by dead bodies everywhere. I reached out and touched one of the girls next to me, and her body was ice cold. And this is when I finally realized that I was still alive. I ran back to the barrack where Miriam was watching our belongings, because in Auschwitz you never left anything unattended. I told her how sad it was that so many people were killed so close to liberation. Then we wondered, and why did the Nazis come back? That wasn't good news. Then we found out in the middle of the night, they blew up the gas chamber, the crematorium, the Canada building, and they were trying to eliminate as much of the evidence as they could. Our barrack was on fire. We couldn't stand the heat. We walked outside. The same four Nazis were waiting for us, ordered us to march. Anyone who couldn't walk fast enough was shot on the spot. We arrived in Auschwitz one an hour later, 
and 600 more people were murdered, according to the Auschwitz Museum. When we arrived in Auschwitz I, they couldn't take us any further because the Allies were outside the city limits. The Nazis were fighting, were not willing to give up, and the Allies were definitely trying to liberate Auschwitz. My biggest problem in Auschwitz I, there was no, no water to drink. So in sheer despair, I went to the nearby river. I broke the ice, lowered the container tied to a string. And when I looked up across the river bank, I could not believe my eyes. There was a little girl my age. She was dressed in beautiful, clean clothes, braided hair with ribbons. And what really blew me away is the fact that she was carrying a school bag. That was the first time in nine months since I arrived in Auschwitz that I realized that in that big, big world, there were children who looked like children and who went to school. A few days later, it was very, very quiet, eerily quiet. And we thought maybe this will be the day we will be free. On January 27, 1945, Saturday afternoon, about 4.30, a woman ran into the barrack, yelling at the top of her voice, we are free, we are free. Wonderful. What does it mean? Does she really know what she's talking about? Is that all the signs that we will get, that we are free? So Miriam and I, the, I don't know if any of you visited Auschwitz, but Auschwitz one, the buildings are two story and the barracks are on the second story. We looked down, couldn't see anything. We went downstairs. It was snowing heavily. The visibility was very poor. It took me about 30 minutes to adjust my eyes. At a distance, I could see lots of people, and they were all wrapped in white camouflage raincoats. They were smiling from ear to ear. And the most important part for me was that they didn't look like the Nazis. We ran up to them. They gave us chocolate, cookies, and hugs. It was the Ukrainian unit of the Soviet army for me to realize that Miriam and I were free and alive, that my little promise to myself that first night in the latrine became a reality. That was an unbelievable experience. That day, the Ukrainian unit of the Soviet army came into the barrack. They drank a little bit of vodka. They danced a lot of Russian dances. We stood in a circle and we were applauding. They disappeared for three days. Then they came back with huge cameras. I have never seen such big cameras before. Asked us to put on striped prison uniforms and they marched us between the two rows of barbed wire fences that surround the Auschwitz I camp. I can tell you one thing. Miriam and I are in the front. They are known as the liberation pictures. And as I looked at those pictures, Miriam and I look very neat, even in Auschwitz. I buttoned up all the shirt, the sleeves were rolled up. We look neater than any of the other kids wearing the striped prison uniforms. So it pays to look neat. <laughs> That's my conclusion. You also See me, if you have seen those liberation pictures there on the front of my book, we look very chubby. Well, people can't understand these starved children looking so chubby. We were on our own for three weeks. We ate anything that we could find. 
And actually, Miriam and I had to police one another not to overeat. If any of you have been on a starvation diet for nine months, and then you eat anything you can find, you will blow up like a little balloon. So that is what you see in that picture. I want to thank you for listening to my life story. This, today's lecture is lecture 120 this year. So what I'm trying to tell you is that I talk a lot. <laughs> Why do I talk a lot? I have learned some very important lessons in my tragic life, and I call them life lessons. And I hope by sharing three of them that some of you might be able to use them. Life lesson number one, never ever give up on yourself or on your dreams. I want you to remember that growing up, and those of you who have grown up in the United States, you will agree with me, that growing up is very hard. And it's very hard even in the United States even if you have loving parents, and there is a thought, what if every child in the world would be born into a loving, caring family? Wouldn't that solve a lot of our problems? And what a wonderful world that would be. And even if your loving parents are wealthy enough to buy you the latest style of Jeans with holes in them. <laughs> I can't understand why anybody would want them, but I know they do. <clears throat> Even then, every young person wonders, how on earth do I fit into this big, big, mixed-up world? Will I be able to accomplish in life what I set out to do? I have to repeat it. If you give up, nothing will happen. On the other hand, if you keep hammering away at it, your wonderful minds will come up with answers that will work. I want you to remember that there is always hope after despair, and there is always a tomorrow after disaster. And if we don't give up on ourselves and on our dreams, we can accomplish anything we put our minds to. I had no idea how to survive Auschwitz. I tried different things. And here I am 70 years later, very happy to be alive. Life lesson number two deals with prejudice. One of the reasons that Adolf Hitler rose to power, the number one reason, is bad economy. And I have done a little study about genocides, Rwanda, Darfur. And bad economies, in my opinion, are a seed for genocide. The unemployment in Germany, when Hitler rose to power, was 33.5%. One third of the population was starving to death, there were no social institutions to help feed them. And he, the Germans were willing to accept anything. And Hitler told them that he was going to take care of them and improve their economic situation. But once he rose to power, he decided it was a lot faster to blame it on somebody else. And he blamed it, of course, of the, on the Jews. Jews were always used as the scapegoats for centuries. And everybody accepted it. Even though I was a cute little girl, I didn't know how, what I had to do. Why he, did Hitler blame me for it? But that's what happened. Prejudice, he used prejudice against Jews. And uh, as I look around in the world today, Prejudice is rampant. It has not vanished from the face of this earth. And I must confess to you that I am prejudiced, not against any race, 
religion, or ethnic group. What I do not like is the way particularly students in school dress, but I, some of you are mature enough. In 1960, did you go downtown without being dressed up properly? No. We always dressed up neatly. I dressed my children. And I think <clears throat> that there is a sloppiness that's very acceptable lately. I will never show you my bulges. They are mine and they are covered. <laughs> but I see people flaunting everything. <laughs> and while you are grown-ups, you can flaunt whatever you want. But in schools, I find it very inappropriate. Sometimes these teenage girls come with very low-cut blouses. They are flaunting what they have or they wish they had. I don't know. <laughs> so if I ruled the world, I tell them, I would put all students from age 6 to 18 in uniforms. And they say, that's terrible. I said, why is it terrible? Why do you go to school? Well, to learn, I said, and not to compare in the morning who has the most provocative outfit, right? <laughs> because I know what's happening in those, and the teachers are trying to take care of the dress code, and it's a bigger problem than they realized. And I, so I don't like low-cut blouses. I don't like guys with ponytails. I don't, <laughs> I don't even like guys with earrings either, and I know that's quite popular even in, among athletes. <clears throat> I don't like body piercings. Why would anybody put a hole in their nose and their eyelids? <laughs> and I don't like tattoos. Now, I don't know how much has been done a study, but I would like to know if anybody knows about it. Ink is not a healthy thing to have in your body, I don't think. And yet, many of these young people, or sometimes middle-aged or older people, <laughs> I don't understand this style because I tell them one thing, you probably are spoiled brats. <laughs> and they look at me, I said, if you, had to fight to have another piece of bread or to be free. Do you think you would think about tattooing your body? They said, absolutely not. I said, that's my case. You are spoiled, now you don't know what to do with your time and your body, so you are going to decorate it with all kind of crazy tattoos. The worst of the things that I don't like is baggy pants. Why would anybody want to wear baggy pants? <laughs> About a month ago, a group came to the museum, and there was a young man with bag, very baggy pants. <clears throat> and I said to him, why are you wearing baggy pants? He said, they are very comfortable. I said, try a skirt. He didn't like my idea, but skirts are more comfortable than baggy pants. Well, about 16 years ago, I was invited to lecture at the high school in Terre Haute. And as I am heading to the auditorium, in front of me are three young boys with extremely baggy pants. The crutch was the height of the knee. <laughs> they were holding on to their pants with one hand and the bottoms of the pants were shuffling and cleaning the hallway. <laughs> As I was walking behind them, one of the young men dropped a book. And then he had the audacity to bend down and pick it up. He let go of his pants. <laughs> and I saw places where the sun never shined. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, I turned away. <laughs> but then I realized that this school 
was in my county, supported by my tax money. So then I got really mad. I went up to the teacher. I told him what happened, and I pointed out the three young men, and I said, they must be all bums. They look like bums. <laughs> and why would anybody want to look like a bum? They probably are drug addicts. <laughs> so he looked at me and said, these three boys are very good students. They have never used any drugs. I was shocked. <laughs> but I realized one simple thing, that even I don't like the way they look, I have to take the time to get to know each person and judge each person on their merits. So I've been trying to do that for the last 16 years. Life lesson number six. Three, I have forgiven the Nazis, I have forgiven everybody. If anybody would have asked me 22 years ago today if I was going to forgive the Nazis, I would have told you, please find a really good psychiatrist and have your head examined because you must be crazy. I was a very good victim. What does it mean to be a good victim? I hated everybody, and I was angry with the world. And nothing really happened to change that until Miriam died. I arrived home. I used to be a realtor up to five years ago. I arrived home. There was a message on my answering machine from my brother-in-law in Israel telling me very simply, your sister died. I immediately called Israel, and I told him that I will catch the first flight I can find. He said, don't bother. The funeral is in 10 hours. Israel is seven hours ahead. There is no way you can make it. I pleaded with him. I have never buried any member of my family. Such a simple, human gesture. I wanted to say goodbye to Miriam, and I even wanted to say goodbye to my kidney she was taking with her. <laughs> but my brother-in-law said, we won't wait for you. So I was left with a lot of pain. I would wake up many nights suffocating, because that is what happened to Miriam, her lungs they're filled with cancer. And twins have a unique connection. Then I couldn't fall back asleep. I knew that ultimately I would do something in her memory. And two years after her death, I opened Kendall's Holocaust Museum. One month after Miriam's death, I received a telephone call unrelated to her death from a professor at Boston College Dr. John Michalczyk, and he said to me, Eva, I have heard you speak about Nazi medicine. You spoke at Boston School of Medicine, and I'm doing one of those conferences, and I want you to come to Boston and lecture to some doctors. I said, good, I love to lecture to doctors. <laughs> he said, why is that? I said, because I go to the doctors, and they tell me I am too fat, I eat the wrong food, I don't exercise enough, and after they chew me out, I have to pay them. <laughs> so I would like to tell the good do doctors what they do wrong, because in my opinion, doctors do plenty of things wrong. And after I chew them out, I look forward to them paying me. <laughs> now that is a way to get even with the doctors. He said to me, OK, OK, Eva, it's very nice, but when you come to Boston, it would be really good if you could bring with you a Nazi doctor. Stunned at such a request, I blurted out immediately, where on earth do you think I can find one of those guys? Because they are not advertising in the yellow pages. <laughs> so he said, OK, you like to joke a lot, but I really want you to be serious and think about it. 
And maybe you come up with some kind of an idea, and I did. Next day, I remembered that the last project that Miriam and I worked on was in 1992, a documentary done by a German television where they interviewed 44 of the surviving Mangala twins. And when I got the video, there was a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz who was also interviewed. So I figured if he was alive in 1992, he might be still alive in 1993. I immediately faxed the letter to the German television <clears throat> telling them that Miriam died. And Miriam and I were co-consultants on that documentary. So they knew Miriam and me very well. And I said to them that please give me Dr. Munch's telephone number in the memory of Miriam. Because I asked for that in 1992 and they refused to give out guests telephone numbers. We got Dr. Munch's telephone number, we contacted him, invited him to Boston. He said he was not coming to Boston, but he was willing to meet with me at his house in Germany. So August of 1993, I am going to Germany to meet a Nazi doctor. You have no idea how scared I was. What I remembered about Nazi doctors, I did not want to experience again. But I was very curious, because he was Mengele's friend. Maybe he knew something about our experiments. And I was curious, why was this Nazi doctor willing to meet with me? We arrived at his house. He treated me with the utmost respect, kindness, and consideration. As we were sitting down, I said to him, that is very, very strange. Here I am, a survivor of Auschwitz, and here you are, a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz, and I like you. He gave me, he told me that he didn't know anything about our experiments, because Mengele always said, that the twins' experiments were top secret. He gave me a good interview about his, what he did in Auschwitz, in his lab, for my Boston conference. And then we were sitting outside, and it seemed like the interview was over. And suddenly, a strange thought popped into my head. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Munch, by any chance, did you know anything about the operation of the gas chambers in Auschwitz? And he immediately said, this is my problem. This is a nightmare that I live with every single day of my life. And he went on describing the operation of the gas chamber. First of all, to me, it's still amazing. The only Nazi I have met up to that time, happened to be stationed at the gas chamber. And he was willing to tell me that. He said people would be told that they are going to take a shower after the long trip. And they were looking forward to it. Once the shower room, and the shower room was cleaned, polished, they would even spread a lot of perfume so people would be really comfortable. Then the shower room was packed with people. The doors would close hermetically. Dr. Munch was outside looking through a peephole. The gas did not come from the shower heads. The shower heads were there strictly as a camouflage. Zyklon B looks like pellets of white gravel. They were packed in canisters. The canisters were opened outside the roof and dropped through vent holes. They fell to the floor, and they operated like dry ice. So the gas was rising from the floor as people were gasping for the last breath of air. They would try to climb on other people staying alive 
another second or two. The strongest people ended up on the top of that pile of human being trying to live one more minute. He knew when the people on the top of the pile stopped moving that everybody was dead and signed one death certificate. No names, just the number of people who were murdered, anywhere from 500 up to 3,000. I told him immediately, I have never, ever read about it in any book, haven't seen it in documentaries, I haven't heard about it. And I asked him to come with me to Auschwitz, where I was going in 1995 to celebrate 50 years to the liberation of the camp. I wanted him to sign a document at the ruins of the gas chamber in the company of witnesses, so nobody could say later on that he didn't sign that document. And he immediately told me I would love to. So I got back to Terre Haute, Indiana, very excited that I will have an original document signed not by a Jewish survivor, not by a liberator, but actually by a Nazi who witnessed it. And if I ever meet or would meet a revisionist of people who say that the Holocaust didn't happen, I could take that document and shove it in their face. But I was also, for some strange reason, and I cannot even understand it, I wanted to thank Dr. Munch for his willingness to go with me to Auschwitz and document the operation of the gas chamber. I did not tell anybody that I wanted to thank him, because I was sure that people would try to discourage me, and I didn't want anybody to discourage me. But I didn't know how to thank a Nazi doctor. So I went to the local Hallmark shop. They have lots of cards, lots of thank you cards. And I went to the section of thank you cards, and I began reading card, and I was very serious, card after card, for two and a half hours. Two ladies came up to me, said, you've been reading those cards for a long time. I said, yes. Are you finding what you are looking for? said, not really. <laughs> well, tell us what are you looking for. Maybe we can help you find it. I said, no, no, no. Thank you very much. I left the card shop, but I couldn't give up my idea. I went back to my own life lesson number one. For the next 10 months while I was cooking, cleaning, driving the car, when my mind wasn't too busy, I was brainstorming. What can I give this Nazi doctor? How can I thank him? And lots of ideas popped into my head until 10 months later, a simple idea. How about a letter of forgiveness from me to him? I knew immediately that this was a meaningful gift for Dr. Munch. But what I discovered for myself was life-changing. I discovered that I, the little victim of 50 years, had the power to forgive. No one could give me that power. No one could take it away. It was all mine to use it in any way I wished. So I began writing a letter of forgiveness for Dr. Munch. I did not know how to write a letter of forgiveness to a Nazi. It took me four months. I worked through a lot of pain. I finally liked what I wrote. And then it occurred to me that somebody might read my letter. And the truth is that my spelling in English is atrocious. <laughs> I didn't want to be embarrassed. So I called my former English professor, asked her to correct my spelling. We met three times. And the third time, she said to me, now, Eva, that is very nice that you forgive Dr. Munch, 
But your problem is not with Dr. Munch. It is with Dr. Mengele. You need to forgive Dr. Mengele. I tried to debate that. She said, OK, do me a favor. When you go home tonight, close the bedroom door and tell Mengele that you are going to forgive him. Because what I really want to find out, how would that make you feel if you could actually do it? Sounded like an interesting idea. I got home. I looked up as many nasty words in the dictionary <laughs> as I could find. I wrote them down, closed the bedroom door, and then I read all those words. And then I said at the end, in spite of everything, I forgive you. And that was such an interesting feeling that I, the little guinea pig from Auschwitz, had even power over Joseph Mengele. Because that last statement, I forgive you, Dr. Mengele, can never be changed. He cannot I'll do anything to change that. So my last relationship with Dr. Mengele is my forgiveness. It made me feel very powerful that I could even do something that Mengele couldn't change. I wasn't hurting anybody, so why couldn't I do it? And if I forgave Mengele the worst of them, I figured that I might as well forgive everybody who has ever hurt me. And this is the way we arrived in Auschwitz. I arrived with my son, Alex, and daughter, Rina. Dr. Munch came with his daughter, Ruli, and son, Gigo, and granddaughter, Iris. Dr. Munch signed his document. I read mine and signed it, and I immediately felt that all the pain that I carried around for 50 years was lifted from my shoulder, that I was no longer a victim of Auschwitz, nor was I a prisoner of my tragic past. I was free of Auschwitz, and I was free of Mengele. My forgiveness is different than anything else you have heard. It has nothing to do with any religion. Because if you connect it to a religion and that person who needs forgiveness, forgiving is not that religion, that immediately they will eliminate that idea. I think forgiveness is for every human being. It's an act of self-healing, self-liberation, and self-empowerment. And to me, the idea that I have any power over my life from now on is extremely important. Up to that day, I continuously reacted to what other people did to me. Now I was initiating action. People can react to it or not. That's their choice. It made me feel good to have that power. And I would say that all victims on the face of this earth are hurt, they feel hopeless, they feel helpless, and they definitely feel powerless to do anything. If we look at life, and we look at Hitler himself, Hitler considered himself a victim, and he was going to show the world. He was very angry. So I call anger a seed for war. Anybody who forgives is at peace with himself or herself. We do not want to hurt anybody. Therefore, I call forgiveness a seed for peace. If any of you at this conference are angry or hurt by anybody, all you really need to do is have a piece of paper and a pen and write a letter to the person or people who hurt you. At the end of that letter, you must write the words 
I forgive you and you must mean the world I forgive you. Please do not mail it to anybody. Because I just got a telephone call a few months ago from a woman who mailed it to her former boyfriend who raped her. And he said to her, you, I need to forgive you because of your testimony. I spent five years in jail. So we don't want to renew this toxic relationship. The forgiveness is for you. And if you feel liberated and empowered, pass it on. Because I need everybody's help to sow those seeds of peace throughout the world. I also tweet. I have my tweet uh, address there. And if anybody wants to follow any little pearl of wisdom that I might come up with, you are welcome to follow me. Congratulations. You survived my lecture. You are free. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I would be glad to answer them. If you want to purchase any books or DVDs or want a picture, I will be going outside, and you can come up close and talk to me. So the people who are managing the thing here are in charge. How much time do we have? 15 minutes? We could probably take about five to ten minutes of questions. Okay. I got two. And that I have no question. I have given you more information than I wanted. Only thing that I want. I went to testify experience because now when a perpetrator is testifying, he's actually validated my testimony. So I want and that helps a lot with the revision. The neo Nazi. So I went up to him, and first day he fed me. I out with my and, and what happened was oh, it's, oh, he was sitting on a chair like this. And I was coming from here, and he's reaching up. Hold grabbing my arm quite strongly, but I cannot hold on to him. So I realized he fainted. He was so enthusiastic to get up and shake my hand that he had one of the orthostatic hypertension and fell. And I didn't want this old man to hit his head. So I started screaming, help, I can't hold on to him. So somebody grabbed his head. And then they stabilized him. So I left. The third day of the court session, I said to my attorney, I want a picture with Oscar. I gave him my camera. He actually turned on the video. And I'm going up to him, and I keep telling him that I want him to encourage other Nazis to testify too. When he grabbed, he wants to stand up again. I said, no, 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 we have done that. Please see. <laughs> Then he grabs me, pulls me in, and gives me a hug and a kiss. Uh, I was not, that I wouldn't have done myself, but because of, and we had it on video, a reporter from the London Times said, I want that. And uh, we shared it with him, and by next day it was everywhere. So that is the way that happened. 
because, and I need to thank Oscar Groening for hugging me and kissing me, because suddenly forgiveness became a big issue. I have forgiven the Nazis 20 years ago. This, just this week, I received a telephone call from New York from an organization that is trying to document Nazis, Jews. I said, could we get Oscar to go to Auschwitz so you could walk in Auschwitz with a Nazi? I said, I have done that in 1995. <laughs> really? I have never heard about it. That is amazing. A perpetrator and a survivor walking the camp where it happened. So I think it's going to get all that information. We'll get a lot more publicity. OK, I just thought I'd give you a little insight into my notoriety. <laughs> all right. Thank you for being here and being such a good audience. And I'm sure that, that many of you probably have some questions you'd like to